you very much indeed, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be back uh, uh, this morning. Wonderful day yesterday, uh, and uh, we're privileged to see just how beautiful uh, Cartagena is. Uh, I just wish I had the chance to spend some more time here. Um, anyway, uh, I'm now going to talk uh, about perioperative optimization of Crohn's disease, uh, which is a really important point. And I'm going to try and cover some, ver some different areas here. We're going to talk about the preoperative optimization uh, of patients, correction of abnormal physiology, thinking about medication, although I'll avoid uh, uh, Dr. Kotz's uh, uh, talk for later on, eradication of sepsis. Uh, then we'll talk about how we survey patients post-operatively uh, because of the risk of recurrence and indeed what we do to prevent that post-operative recurrence. And of course, the reason this is important is because most patients with Crohn's disease, even nowadays, despite the best therapies we have, still most patients with Crohn's disease end up having surgery at some point. And of course, surgery is not curative. It is simply fixing the problems that we fail to prevent with medical therapy. Uh, and therefore, the majority of them will get some form of post-operative recurrence, be that symptomatic recurrence, which lags behind radiological or endoscopic recurrence. And we'll come back to how that gives us an opportunity about how to deal with uh, the prevention of recurrence over time. So I'm going to start with a really brief case history. And you will all be familiar with patients like this. This is a, a woman in her, her 40s who presented with ileal Crohn's disease about 10 years ago on standard investigations at the time, barium follow-through, uh, colonoscopy. And she's got about 20 centimeters of ileal Crohn's disease. Uh, as is fairly typical, uh, she's a heavy smoker. Uh, and as uh, not infrequently occurs uh, with some of our patients, she didn't want any treatment. She was scared of all these drugs, probably scared by Dr. Siegel and his and his talk of lymphoma and all these sorts of things. He didn't want any medical therapy. Uh, she had some oral antibiotics. She had some uh, 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 enteral nutrition, and this settled her down. And then she became asymptomatic. Despite the fact that we tried very hard to explain to her the, the relatively low risks of medical therapy, she didn't want immuno, any immunomodulatory therapy. And while she recognized the risks of smoking and therefore decreased her intake of cigarettes, she didn't stop. She then, unsurprisingly, had recurrent admissions over the next few years. Uh, and uh, uh, as Paolo discussed yesterday, we offered her primary surgery. It's going to be a relatively good treatment, at least in the short term, for her. Uh, the surgeons were keen to help with this, but the patient wasn't. And indeed, with a conservative therapy, she settled on each occasion um, uh, and basically lived on no treatment and a low residue diet. Until she came back in again about two years ago now with uh, with worsening symptoms. She had abdominal pain, vomiting, she had a distended abdomen, she'd been losing weight uh, and had recurrent urinary tract infections. On examination, she was found to be pyrexal, she had tenderness and a mass in the right iliac fossa. And as you can see from her blood test, she's clearly got both active disease and infection going on with a raised white count and CRP. And importantly, she's anemic and hypoalbuminemic. So at this point, we reinvestigated her. And this is her colonoscopy. And again, you'll be familiar with this sort of sign. Someone with limited ileal Crohn's disease whose colon looks completely normal. And then you get round to the ileocecal valve and it's all contracted. And often you can't get into the cecum. That, that fold above the cecum is all contracted down. But there's no active disease there because the active disease is all through there in the ileum. And we can see that clearly on her MRI scan uh, with active small bowel disease going down over a fairly decent uh, amount uh, of uh, distance in the terminal ileum, coming down to be opposed to the bladder. And remember, she's had urinary tract infections, suggesting she might have some form of uh, uh, enterovocycle fistula uh, and indeed coming close to her uterus. And of course, we know that this woman needs an operation. She's not going to get better with medical therapy. But how do we deal with this? Should we just get in there and operate now, sort out the problem? Or should we think about downstaging her disease? And if we're going to downstage, how do we do that? Enteral nutrition with antibiotics? Perhaps parenteral nutrition? Perhaps we should deal with the sepsis and then give her a biologic? Or perhaps we should even see if we can downstage all of it and fulfill her wish of avoiding surgery altogether. So there are various ways of dealing with uh, perioperative Crohn's disease, but when it comes to preoperative uh, uh, optimization, we tend to think along these sorts of lines using the acronym SNAP. And that means dealing with the sepsis, 
thinking about nutrition, understanding the anatomy, and then planning the treatment, both medical and surgical, in that preoperative phase. So sepsis is fairly straightforward once you've identified it. Clearly, you need to drain it, and nearly always you can manage this by the help of your interventional radiologists. Uh, occasionally, it's more difficult, particularly with septated um, uh, collections, but nowadays, with the tools available to them, you can normally rely on your radiologist to drain the sepsis. If you can't, then you need the surgeons, and there's really not much you can do about it, but it's often worth trying in the first instance. If you are going to do that, then clearly you need to repeat imaging, not just in the short term to make sure that you've drained the sepsis effectively, but also in the medium term to make sure that the sepsis hasn't come back. Clearly, you need broad spectrum antibiotics in this situation, and as you'll see, we will often continue those for a considerable amount of time. And because of the, uh, uh, because of the active sepsis, we do everything we can to avoid immunosuppressive therapy at this time. The next part of the acronym is nutrition, and I think this is the part that's often not done very well. And of course, it's most important, and we heard about this a little bit yesterday from Dr. Siegel, because poor nutrition is under-recognized in Crohn's disease, and yet is incredibly common. If you look at that statistic there, uh, uh, anything up to 85% of Crohn's disease patients are malnourished. Now, part of the problem with defining malnutrition is that there is no one single definition, but there are various markers that we use. For instance, a low BMI, less than 18.5. I think weight loss is important, and people who've lost a considerable proportion, say 10% of their body weight, uh, are clearly patients who are uh, challenged nutritionally. You can use anthropometric measures, and we'll look at those shortly, and you can think about grip strength. Uh, but clearly, it's not so much what you do, it is that you do it. It's important to consider nutrition and to measure it in your patients and find ways of identifying those ones who are really in trouble. And certainly, if you, again, if you look at the literature, weight loss of greater than 10% is reported in most patients with Crohn's disease in the six months prior to surgery. So what do you do about it? Well, as is often the case in these situations, there are no randomized controlled trials to guide us, but we basically have two options. And the first is enteral nutrition. Enteral nutrition is great. It's really effective. It's cheap. It avoids the needs to put central venous catheter in, uh, catheters in, uh, and it's, uh, it, it, it's often used uh, as pre-optimization, certainly in the UK, uh, for surgical patients. Clearly, pediatricians in many parts of the world use this as a primary therapy to avoid steroids. But, in, uh, but where it's not always considered is where it works often in the best situation, and that's in this preoperative phase, because it decreases the risk of post-operative anastomotic leaks, it decreases the risk of abscesses and wound infections, and it, it decreases the need for diverting stomas. The alternative, of course, is parenteral nutrition. And of course, this is an effective way of treating patients who have active Crohn's disease in the preoperative phase. Now, again, there's limited data there. Uh, but if you, uh, if you look at the data out there, there are, of course, studies that show that it's an effective way of improving nutrition. And in general, it's not associated with too much in the way of complications. Uh, the, the major problem with TPN, of course, is sepsis, so venous catheter sepsis and or thrombosis. And indeed, if you look at the bottom study, a third of the patients uh, in, in this study ended up needing their line changing at some point. Associated with poor nutrition, of course, is hypoalbuminemia. And we know that a low albumin level is associated not just with poor nutrition, but with active inflammation and with sepsis. Again, both of these things are incredibly common in Crohn's disease, so that low albumin is multifactorial in our patients. Most importantly, we know that a low albumin level at the time of operation is associated with post-operative morbidity and mortality. If you look at some of the large data sets out there, first in the non-IBD cohorts looking from the US in the National Veterans Affairs Risk Study, they found that a serum albumin was the best predictor of 30-day mortality, an albumin of less than 21 being associated with a two-thirds risk of morbidity uh, and a 28% risk of mortality. 
Whereas if you had an albumin of greater than 40, uh, if you had an albumin of greater than 21, then the morbidity and mortality was much, much lower. It's important to think about this because nearly always in Crohn's disease, we have the time to think about correcting these risk factors. And indeed, again, if you look at the risks of a low albumin in Crohn's disease, we see something very similar. An albumin of less than 25 at the time of operation was associated with a 10% risk of intra-abdominal sepsis. But that only occurred in one in 50 of the patients with an albumin level of greater than 25. And certainly our surgeons will tend to say to us, we don't want to operate until the albumin's up above 30. And you can nearly always get it there. So to summarize for nutrition, remember, most of our patients who are coming for surgery with Crohn's disease are malnourished. We nearly always have the time to correct malnutrition. This is not like acute severe ulcerative colitis. With careful management of sepsis and nutrition, you've got time and you can get these people through. Enteral nutrition is our preferred route if the patients can tolerate it. And the real reason they can't tolerate it is normally because of such severe stricturing disease that they just have to have parenteral nutrition, which is therefore also worthwhile in this situation, although the costs associated with it and the side effects are greater. The next part of the acronym was A, anatomy. And of course, this is incredibly important. It allows us to identify fistulae, abscesses, and urinary tract involvement, and indeed other organs, and it effectively provides a surgical roadmap. But how do we do this? Well, there are various different ways of thinking about this. Uh, ultrasound is often used, it's cheap, it's safe, it's good for looking at abscesses and pre dilatation, but it's very operator dependent. And unless you have a really good ultrasonographer, it's difficult often to get a really clear idea of the whole totality of what's going on. And indeed, it's time consuming. Uh, CT scans are excellent. Uh, they give you really good resolution. They give you details about extra-intestinal disease. They're very good for detecting small perforations, probably better than MRI, and they are, of course, quick. But many of our patients, and again, it's something Dr. Siegel highlighted yesterday, that patients come into hospital, and the first thing that happens to them is they go straight through the CT scanner on their way to the emergency room. We overexpose our patients to radiation, and we therefore try to avoid CT where we can. It's for this reason that still MRI is probably our preferred um, uh, mode of imaging. It gives good resolution. With cine imaging, you can get a good idea of functional and non-functional stenoses. We can get a reasonable idea of active diseases, and it's very good at identifying fistulizing disease. But it's slow, it's expensive, and of course, it's not universally available. The final bit is making that preoperative plan, and this requires multidisciplinary working as well as optimization of all these other things that we can think about. We need to think about drug therapy, we need to think about smoking, we need to think about anemia, and we need to think about the risk of thromboembolic disease. So we know that steroids are bad in this setting. They've clearly associated with postoperative complications and infections, and it's a dose-related and time-related thing. High doses of steroids for a long time are the biggest risk, and that's why we always try and get people off steroids preoperatively. The risks of thiopurines are less clear. Uh, there's probably a small increase in risk, but remember these are long-acting drugs, and therefore stopping them isn't always going to have an immediate effect. Uh, I'm not going to talk about biologics. I normally have a few slides that I can talk about here, but Paolo is going to talk us through this in much greater detail later. Uh, so you're just going to have to wait until this afternoon to go through this, but we certainly have a plan for how we manage biologics in the perioperative period. And then there's the other parts of this, anemia. Again, just like with albumin, huge data sets have shown that anemia uh, is associated with increased morbidity and mortality over time. And of course, we know that this is a common problem in Crohn's disease, often multifactorial uh, in nature, but probably most commonly related to iron deficiency. And we know that if we correct that anemia, then it's associated with improved outcome in the post-operative period. Smoking, of course, is incredibly common in Crohn's disease, perhaps somewhere between 30 and 40% of patients uh, with uh, Crohn's disease who are undergoing surgery are smokers. And stopping smoking helps in the perioperative period, and key, it helps in the postoperative period because it decreases the risk of recurrence. Non-smokers have lower risks of post-operative intra-abdominal sepsis, and we know that pre-operative cessation of smoking 
decreases the risk of cardiovascular, respiratory, and wound-related complications and reoperation. There used to be this feeling that you shouldn't stop smoking just before an operation because it actually made things worse. But I think recent data suggests that is not true. Stopping smoking at any time is better than continuing smoking. Thromboprophylaxis is also incredibly important. Um, uh, we know that uh, inflammatory bowel disease is associated with an increased risk of DVTs and PEs, and indeed it's one of the few things that still kills people uh, with inflammatory bowel disease. And of course the reasons for this are multifactorial and relate to platelet activation, dehydration, active inflammation, etc. Most importantly, these patients with Crohn's disease in hospital are those at the highest risk. And that risk extends not just in the pre- and perioperative phase, but to way out until 30 days post-operatively. So just as many people are now anticoagulating their patients with cancer after discharge, we do the same. We send our patients home on heparin uh, for at least 30 days in the post-operative period. And it's important to note, I've just mentioned colorectal cancer there, that in fact the risk of thromboembolism is higher in inflammatory bowel disease than in colorectal cancer. So we have this approach to how we manage patients uh, in the perioperative period. I'm not going to run through it, but it really just summarizes all of that. About eight weeks prior to surgery, we consider these factors such as the drug history, smoking status, we assess their nutrition, and then we intervene to try to improve that. We don't stop there though, we then reassess them four weeks later and again reassess their nutrition, ensure for example that the enteral nutrition is being taken and is effective. We make sure that we're managing the sepsis and that we've got it totally under control and we think very carefully about our medications uh, in the weeks running up to surgery. And just before, we go just before we get to surgery, we ensure that the steroids are at their lowest level or preferably stopped. We think about venous thromboembolism and we push hard again on the smoking cessation in the perioperative and the postoperative period. Uh, so we decided to just have a look at what introducing this, uh, 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 this did to our patients and we compared, not in a randomized way, but just looking back in our patients who went through this process and compared them with those who didn't go through the process. And we looked at about 30, 35 patients in each group and what you can see is they're very similarly matched. They've got similarly complicated disease, similar exposure to drugs. Um, they're having similar sorts of operations uh, uh, and they're having most of them in, a, uh, in an optimized uh, way, a planned way as opposed to an urgent way. So what happened? Well, perhaps surprisingly, this aggressive nutritional approach had no effect on many of the nutritional markers we're looking at. The BMI, the mid-arm circumference, the uh, waist circumference and the weight didn't change at all. But other important things did. You can see here that the pink optimized group were much more likely to have a normal albumin, they were much more likely to have a normal CRP, uh, they were much less likely to be on steroids, and that resulted in a decreased need for stomas, a decreased incidence of complications, an increased uh, chance of them having a laparoscopic operation, uh, not much in the way of change in intraabdominal sepsis, um, uh, but fewer reoperations needed uh, in those patients who were optimized. And importantly, we could also see that the risks of surgery and medications were largely driven by steroids. So those patients who were still on steroids had a length of stay nearly twice as long as those patients who got off steroids. Not surprisingly, they were much more likely to have stomas and not surprisingly, they were much more likely to have complications. So it shows that having an organized approach to thinking about your patients in that preoperative period can improve outcomes. So for the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about post-operative optimization, and that starts with this. Uh, this is a fairly typical report that we receive from our surgeons. As you can see, it's entirely illegible uh, and describes a very complicated operation, but this is the bit that I'm interested in. This is what's left behind. Here's the DJ flexure, here's the 215 centimeters of normal bowel, and here's the strictures that he removed. And in fact, he just took all of that out in the end. But this is what I need to know, what's left behind. 
So how do we prevent post-operative recurrence in Crohn's disease? Well, first of all, we need to define it, uh, and we can define it in terms of the need for surgery, survival without symptoms, or endoscopic lesions. And as you know, most people end up with endoscopic recurrence, and as time goes by, symptoms and surgery become more and more common. And we'll go back to it again, smoking really drives that risk of post-operative recurrence. Whether you look in individual studies or, or meta-analyses, we see that, the, that active smoking doubles the risk of post-operative recurrence. So we really have to try to stop our patients smoking. Uh, we know that people who had perforating disease prior to surgery are also much more likely to get post-operative recurrence. Here in this meta-analysis, an odds ratio of 1.5, uh, suggesting that if your patients had penetrating disease in the past, you need to be more aggressive. And then there's a variety of other risk factors that we can identify of varying usefulness. Uh, uh, young age at onset may be a greater risk, short duration of disease, previous history of surgery, family history possibly, disease extent, and you can put all of this into the mix along with some of these other non-clinical factors like the presence of granulomas, uh, a history, uh, sorry, uh, myenteric plexitis on the resection specimens, uh, genetics we heard a little bit about yesterday although we don't tend to use it, and indeed serology. You put all of this together, you can start to get a feel for those patients who are at higher risk of recurrence and therefore those patients that you need to treat a little bit more aggressively. So it's all very well identifying those patients, but in fact the key, and again, are we coming back to it again and again, whether you're thinking about treating to target, whether you're thinking about monitoring people after withdrawal of therapy, monitoring is the key. So how do we monitor patients for post-operative uh, recurrence? And in fact, this is what we do. And again, we talked about this briefly yesterday. This is a Rutgert score, and we do this normally six months, maybe a year after colonoscopy. And we do this because we know that if we look at the terminal ileum in people who have had a resection, we can grade it depending on the severity of the recurrence, the number of ulcerations, the severity of ulcerations, and indeed the development of strictures, and that that is associated with subsequent outcome. This original work by Paul Rutgers uh, 20 years ago showing that for example if you have I4 recurrence uh, then your chance uh, of uh, having future surgery is hugely greater than if you have I0 or I1 and that's where this cutoff of I2 comes from because these people have a worse prognosis. Are there other ways of monitoring for recurrence postoperatively? Well, yes, you can do ultrasound, you can use MRI, you can use capsule, but these things haven't moved into clinical practice in the majority yet because the Rutgers score is easy to do, and of course colonoscopy is a safe and effective way of assessing it. There's certainly been some interest in calprotectin, uh, and we'll come back to the POCA study shortly, but this is data from the POCA study uh, showing that if you use a a cutoff of 100, then in fact your chance of having an I2 score at that point is relatively low. I'm still anxious about using calprotectin in this setting. Uh, I do measure it and many times I've seen a normal calprotectin and then gone into the terminal ileum and seen at least I2 recurrence, so I don't use this in clinical practice. So finally, we've identified that we can stratify people. We know that we can then monitor them post-operatively, but what should we do about it? What drugs should we use to prevent recurrence? So uh, this is the data on 5-ASA therapy. 5-ASA uh, uh, has a very limited role, in my, in my view, in the post-operative setting. Certainly meta-analyses suggest that you can possibly prevent a little bit of recurrence, but you can see the number needed to treat uh, is 12, but that's for clinical recurrence, and its role in endoscopic recurrence uh, appears to be non-existent. Uh, so um, after 5-ASA, we come on to antibiotics, and these are quite commonly used uh, in, in the UK and Europe, and really because there's almost no reason not to. If you use them at a low enough dose, they're well tolerated, and the evidence that they have some beneficial effect exists and is fairly strong. So we tend to give metronidazole to most patients. Thiopurines, it becomes a little bit more tricky. This is a study from the UK, the TOPIC study, uh, which was a randomized trial using mecaptopurine as a dose of one milligram per kilogram uh, in the post-operative setting. And patients were followed up for up to three years in this situation. Now, in fact, it failed to reach its primary endpoint. As you can see, that primary endpoint uh, was uh, an 
a, a, an active uh, Crohn's disease activity index with an increase of baseline of 100 points, but also the need for anti-inflammatory rescue therapy or surgical intervention. And you can see that whilst the, uh, uh, the outcome was uh, less frequent in the mercaptopurine group than in the placebo group, in the primary adjusted analysis, which is the primary outcome, it didn't reach its endpoint. What this study did show is that higher risk patients tended to do better. So for example, if you pull out smokers, they benefited more from thiopurines in the post-operative setting. And of course, if we look at other data out there, this is a study looking at the combination of metronidazole and placebo or metronidazole and azathioprine. Uh, and we see here that endoscopic recurrence is decreased when you use azathioprine compared to placebo. So to my mind, thiopurines work in the post-operative setting, they're appropriate, but as, in, as is often the case, they're probably less effective than anti-TNF. Uh, this was Miguel Reguero's original trial, uh, randomizing uh, 24 patients either to infliximab or placebo in the post-operative setting. And as you can see, there was an absolutely barn door clear signal here that infliximab was better than placebo. Uh, going on to the much larger uh, trial that was then performed using infliximab, the results came out as negative. The reason for that, however, is almost certainly because they chose clinical recurrence as their endpoint rather than, the, uh, rather than endoscopic recurrence. And in a short-term trial like this, you nearly need, you're very unlikely to find a clinical outcome. We really need to be thinking about endoscopic outcomes. And indeed, when you do look at endoscopic outcomes in this trial, clearly infliximab was better than placebo. Which leads us on to the last trial we're going to look at, which is POCA. So this was, uh, I think, a great study uh, put together by Mike Cam and colleagues in Australasia. Uh, it was a multi-center trial of patients undergoing resections for Crohn's disease, and it compared a sort of active versus standard care um, uh, uh, routine in the prevention of recurrence. So they recruited uh, about 175 patients across 20 centers in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and this is what they did. So they took their patients with post-operative Crohn's disease, and first of all, they categorized them into high-risk patients, so that's patients with previous surgery, penetrating disease, or smoker, uh, and indeed we talked about that earlier, or low-risk, most of them being high-risk. Those patients who were high-risk then went on to metronidazole with azathioprine, or if they were intolerant of azathioprine, adalimumab, whereas those who were low-risk simply went on to metronidazole and they were then randomized either to a standard care arm or an active care arm. In the, uh, with the primary output being the colonoscopy score at 18 months. So if you were in the active care arm, you then went on to have a colonoscopy at six months. And at that point, you had a Rutgert score performed. And if you hit a Rutgert score of equal to or greater than I2, you stepped up your therapy. If you were only on metronidazole, you went on to a thiopurine. If you were only on, to, on a thiopurine, you went on to adalimumab. And if you were already on adalimumab, you went up to weekly. And then they looked at the primary endpoint in this group here who had the colonoscopy and compared it with the standard care arm here. And they showed a number of interesting things. And the first interesting thing is that that, re that intervention at six months makes a difference. It is worth doing because those patients in the active care arm were less likely to have recurrence than those in the standard care arm. So it made a difference, okay? Um, uh, uh, the next thing to point out uh, is that those patients who had no disease was much higher in the patients in the active arm. So you can see again, 20% of patients in this arm had an I0 at that time, whereas very few in the standard care arm. What's also interesting is that of the patients who had the colonoscopy at uh, six months, 40% of them had I2 or greater, and that of those, you could get 40% of them back into remission, again, suggesting that intervening at six months makes a difference in the longer term. And the other thing that this taught me is that 40% of patients who had no active disease at six months then went on to have active disease at 18 months. And I think we've all been very happy with doing a colonoscopy at six months, but we've not known what to do thereafter. So this told us you can't just stop at six months, you need to keep monitoring, and probably an appropriate time point to do that again is 18 months. <laughs> 
So, coming to the end, in terms of prevention of recurrence, it's really important, and again, it goes back to my first talk about treating to target. It's important to stratify patients, and it's important to intervene right at time point zero where it's appropriate. As always, we need to reassess patients, and we need to reassess them early at six months, and we need to keep reassessing them initially with a further colonoscopy at 18 months. And importantly, when we find disease, we need to step up. So to, summary, to summarize, I think avoiding surgery is a good thing to do as long as it's appropriate to do that. And of course, there are times when doing surgery is the better. SNAP is a useful acronym to use. It helps us minimize preoperative morbidity and mortality uh, with optimization and planning, and it helps to minimize the post-operative problems that we see. We should manage our drugs proactively in the perioperative period, and particularly importantly, get them off steroids. And then once we've gone through surgery, we should have a clear plan about how we're going to prevent post-operative recurrence and use drugs in the appropriate way to make sure we do that optimally. Thank you very much.